Acts chapter 11, Acts chapter 11 this morning, Acts chapter 11, and let's get right into the Word of God today. I've just switched the lapel mic on there. A lot of work is going on uh, here on this property. We are working on sound systems and, and uh, all kinds of things. Thank you, fellas, and those of you who are working on that, appreciate that so much. Acts chapter 11 this morning, Acts chapter 11. Somebody asked me, said, Pastor, we we're in Acts chapter 11, and we've been in here in Acts since, since February. And uh, when are we going to get done? Well, when Jesus comes back, evidently. All right, we're just, we'll just get there. Acts chapter number 11. Acts chapter number 11. And we'll read all the way down to verse number uh, 26. Acts chapter 11, verse number 26 this morning. Excuse me, 19 through 26. Praise the Lord. All God's people say, bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Amen. Bless the Lord. Acts chapter 11. Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phenice and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. And some of them were men of Cy Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them. And a great number believed and turned to the Lord. And then the tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church which was in Jerusalem. They sent forth Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch, who when he came and had seen the grace of God was glad and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith. And much people were added to the Lord. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him into Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Just a couple of phrases to bring out this morning. The Bible says a great number believed and turned to the Lord. Then the Bible says that much people was added unto the Lord. The Bible speaks of a discipleship process and people earn the moniker Christians. It's not something they came up with. It was something they were called. And I want to look this morning at this wonderful passage. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the power of the gospel. Thank you for your hand. Lord, we need your hand on our lives. Lord, we need your hand on this church, on our homes. Lord, on our teenagers, we just need your hand. Lord, this morning, thank you for the testimony of what you did, what you did, because it was your hand, what you did in a place called Antioch. If you did it once, you can do it again. You're no respecter of persons. Father, this morning, may we as a church just glean some truth from your word. May the word get into our hearts. Change your minds, change the way we think, change our desires. And Lord Jesus, we'll thank you for it. And all God's people said, amen. amen and amen. You may be seated there in the presence of the Lord. By way of background, I want to speak to you just about Antioch a little bit this morning. Antioch was called the Queen of the East as a city, known worldwide as a place of artistic beauty, but also perpetual vice. Sitting on the Orontes River on the trade routes between China and Rome in the west, it becomes the third largest city in all of the Roman Empire. In fact, there were only two cities more famous, two cities more powerful, perhaps more influential. That was Alexandria and Rome. And Rome. The merchants of Antioch trade with people from all over the world. Antioch was a multicultural city, including a population of Romans, Greeks, Syrians, Jews. I mean, every tribe under the tongue was in this city. It was a very famous city, very fluent city. It was filled with all kinds of forest and natural beauty and what we would today call national parks. Even back then, they were taking the land and charging people to get back into their own land. Somebody say amen right there. All right, sorry about that. But anyway, uh, national parks, that's my land. But anyway, I'm getting off this morning. Uh, national parks, they set aside huge swaths of land for people just to come and enjoy recreation and nature. And, and it was a wealthy resort city. People traveled there just for family vacations. The up and comers went there. Uh, and, and you can uh, imagine all that was going on behind all that beauty of that natural beauty of the, the manicured lawns, the manicured parks, the resort towns, the resort facilities behind all of that beauty was a cesspool 
of perversion and debauchery. Antioch was deeply corrupt. They had something called the pleasure grounds of Daphne. If you go back and you study Greek mythology, you'll understand who Daphne is. And there was a temple not too far dedicated to the Greek god Apollo. If you know anything about Apollo, he was, he was hit with, a, with an arrow. And that arrow ignited within Apollo an insatiable, and we have all our, most of our children out this morning, an insatiable sexual desire. He was known as the god of lust. And he was doomed for the rest of his eternity, for the rest of his life as Apollo, to pursue that lust and yet never have it fulfilled. And they built a grounds called the Temp Pleasure Grounds of Daphne, which was basically a place where Apollo was worshipped and all that goes in with that. And we'll leave, I was going to say leave it up to your imagination. Please don't let your imagination go too far. But it was a place of great debauchery. These Pleasure Grounds of Daphne where Apollo was worshipped through men and women giving themselves uh, to, uh, to each other. Uh, there were temple prostitutes. There were all kinds of things going on in there. And it was an absolute cesspool of nastiness and perversion. The citizens of Rome held the citizens of Antioch in such low regard. And I mentioned this last week. There was a common saying from the citizens of Rome. By the way, do you realize Rome was no like, you know, Rome wasn't like going to Sunday school. Rome was a wicked city. Even Rome thought Antioch was wicked. You know it's bad when the worst of the worst say you're the worst of the worst. That's how nasty it was. And they said that the, that the, uh, the rivers of the Orientus River dumped its trash in the Tiber River, therefore polluting Rome. Really what they were saying was this city is so nasty, it's so wicked, so vile, filled with all kinds of fornication and, 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 and adultery and all kinds of things, filled with all kinds of sexual perversion that it's messing up Rome had a bad reputation a young man would not come to his parents and say hey I, I met a girl in Antioch can I bring her home <laughs> no you're not allowed to bring a girl home like that or a boy home like that but something amazing happens in this city the gospel comes the gospel comes and while there was a temple erected to Apollo and a whole grounds to Daphne, a church arises and becomes a springboard for world missions activity. Amen. The church at Antioch is the launching site for multiple, multiple mission endeavors, even found in the book of Acts. We'll see them over the next several weeks. It's from Antioch that Paul launches each of his three, if not four, missionary journeys. Evangelistic whirlwinds that just helped the church explode throughout the known world at that time. And some say that he even goes as far as Britain with the gospel. Now, whether he went that far or not, we don't know. But we know the gospel went that far. And let me just say it this way. Not, this is not hyperbole. This is actual truth. You know the gospel today because of the movement that happened in Antioch. God took that little church and God used that church to spread the gospel to the whole world. I'm not one of these that think we can trace every, you know, we can't, we, we, as a church, we can trace it back to this and trace it back to this because there's just so many people that have blessed us and so many people that God has used. But do know this, it is from this movement in this wicked, vile, nasty, perverted city that the whole world comes to know the gospel. So why, why does that interest you? Because if it can happen there, it can happen here. Antioch becomes home to the greatest preachers and Bible teachers of that generation in the first century. Barnabas, Paul, and Peter are there. And according to church history, you got in the second, gen uh, second century, you got Ignatius and Theophilus and then Lucian and Theodore and Chrysostom and, and uh, several other. I'm talking about this place known for filthiness and wickedness comes to also be known as a place where some of the greatest minds and hearts for the word of God are present. What a transformation. What a, what a change in the city. Somebody say amen. What a, you know, it's hard to change your own reputation, much less the reputation of a city. This would be like Las Vegas coming to be known as the place for sending out churches. 
None of us today say, I, you know, look, by the way, we thank God for the work that's being done there. There are good churches there getting the work done. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen and amen. But Las Vegas is not known as Salvation City. It's known as Sin City. This would be like Las Vegas being known as Sending City. Sending people and missionaries and preachers and people out and to seek the saved, to seek the lost and to preach the gospel. That's the work that God did in Antioch. Now, God's arm is not straightened or slackened in any way. He's not of any less power today than he was then. Somebody give me an amen. And we can't tell God what to do, but I know this. You can't tell him what he can't do either. I've entitled today's sermon title, Local Church World Impact. Local church world impact. Because this is exactly what happens from Antioch. How does it happen? How does a mission sending history changing church spring up in the middle of a cesspool of wickedness and debauchery? I'm interested. I'm interested not because I think there's a formula that we can plug in and make it happen. I'm interested because, again, if God can do it there, he can do it anywhere. Amen. Wouldn't it be wonderful if Carmichael, the city of Carmichael, was changed for the gospel? And Citrus Heights, and Fair Oaks, and Orangevale, and Rockland, and Rancho Cordova, and Roseville, and everywhere in between. If Sacramento was changed, if California was changed, if the nation was changed. I don't know what God has in store and what God wants to do, but I do know this much, that God can do anything that God wants to do. And we're not here today to manipulate God. We're not here today because that's not what we can do. But we can simply say, Lord, do it again. Lord, would you do it here? Lord, would you do it here? Local church world impact. Let's have a, another word of prayer. Father, we come this morning. We humbly wait for you. We wait for you. We desire you to move. We humble ourselves this morning. We pray. We, we want to seek your face. We need to turn away from our wicked ways. Lord, I, I don't know what you want to do, but whatever it is you want to do, we want you to do it. We want you to do it here. Lord, this morning, as we come to this passage, we understand that this is not a formula to plug in and somehow make you work. But Lord, may we just see some of the elements of what you did in and through people's lives that allow this church to become a missions sending, history changing church. And Lord, it matters not to us if the records of history record anything that we do or anybody else does for you, but Lord, it matters to us what heaven records. Lord, we simply want to make an impact in our lifetime. Help us, please, in Jesus' name. And all God's people said. Just a few observations this morning from Acts chapter 11, verses 19 through 26. These are not deep observations. I have six or seven I want to give you today. As God began to work and bless these people. And I want to say this again. There's this beautiful balance. We understand this morning that God is always responsible for the harvest. Let's get that out of the way. Somebody say amen. It's God that gets the glory. As we come this morning, as we read in the Psalms, that Lord, we magnify you. We exalt you. That if there's anything ever good, ever done through us, in us, it's because Jesus Christ did it. Christ is our hope. Christ is our glory. Christ is our strength. He's our power. He's, God's the one that works in us, both the will and the do of his good pleasure. If if you even have a good desire this morning, it's because God gave it to you. Amen. So again, I want to affirm very clearly that any hope we have of this ever happening, hopes, our hopes rest alone in the Lord. And that's a good place to hope. Somebody say amen. But I want to look this morning at, at what God did and some of the hearts that the, and the attitudes that God gave these people and how this came about. And the, first of all, I want you to notice just a couple of things. We need to go out before we're forced out. Look with me, verse number 19. They which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Venice and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. Why are these people moving? Why are they moving out? It is not because they initially have a heart for missions. It's because they need to save their own skin. They have to leave Jerusalem because this persecution of Stephen, which happens at least seven years prior to this more than likely, happens a long time, is beginning 
continued to push them further and further away from Jerusalem and the Jerusalem of Jeru of uh, the jurisdiction of Jerusalem. The point I simply want to make to you this morning is why is it that we wait until something bad happens before we do something good? Why is it that we must be motivated by consequence rather than obedience? Why is it that as the people of God, that are you ready for this? I love you this morning. You may not be comfortable because I feel, I'm feeling comfortable. I know when I'm feeling good, it's hot down there, all right? Or it's freezing down there. But know this, I'm thankful to have a building. I'm thankful we're here. I'm thankful for all of it. But if we're not careful, we're going to get comfortable and just sit in here until Jesus comes back. We'll just sit here. And we'll sit here until we die because, you know what, we've got it good and we're blessed beyond measure. And Christians all over the world, they have no earthly idea of what it means to have a building, much less air conditioning or parking spots. They didn't have to, well, you know, if you walk to church today, it's because you probably live close by, not because you didn't have transportation or you had no other way to get here. And the point I just simply want to make to us today is that we oftentimes wait until things get hot, things get heavy or becomes necessary to act before we actually act. And we do that. We, we stand up for our children once, once a bill is passed. Not before. We, we, we stand up when, when, when Roe v. Wade has been in and millions of children have been slaughtered and butchered. Where was everybody when it was passed in the first place? You say, well, don't you? I wasn't alive, so I won't take the blame for it, all right? But I, I'll take the blame with it. Do you understand? We, we often are reactionary to what we're doing. Let me say to you this morning that as far as the gospel is concerned, that we are to, let's go out before we're forced out. I do believe that persecution is coming. It's already here in this nation. Uh, and, and not certain ways that you may see, but as we had Larry, uh, Harry Mehetz from Liberty Council, there have been pastors arrested in this state, in this country. Yes, within the last several weeks and years and months for preaching the gospel according to their own conscience. Somebody give me an amen right That really happens. It has happened. And it's already here. And I, sometimes I wonder, in fact, I'm sure of it. God designs, permits, and allows persecution of his people so that we'll not be comfortable and that we'll not sit on our hands and to look in here and say, oh, how beautiful things are in the beautiful auditorium, but that we'll go out and preach the gospel like we're supposed to. You say, I, I, I'd like to avoid persecution. That's not a biblical attitude in the first place. But let me just simply say, let's not wait until things get bad, until our neighbors are almost dead, until our children are so far gone. Let's not wait till then to be obedient and preach the gospel. Amen. Number two, let's be pioneers and go to dark places. The Bible says in verse number 20, some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they were come to Antioch, Spake unto the Grecians preaching the Lord Jesus. I need to confess something to you this morning. And don't throw a rock at me when I say it. Please don't. I have never. I can't believe I'm about to say this, Brother Noel. I have never liked the name Pioneer Baptist Church. I have never liked it. I never liked the name Pioneer. I never did. I didn't like it when I came. I didn't. I didn't like it until I started studying this for this message, to be honest with you. So God has done a work in my heart in the last week. I, amen. <laughs> a few years back, I purchased domain names. I purchased websites, all with a ministry name on it, had new logos designed, all waiting for the day we made it to the new property. We said, hallelujah, God's done something new. Let's change our name. And I, I was, I mean, gung-ho on. I've been, I've had these websites for three years, four years. Lo and behold, we move over here and there is a ministry in the vicinity that has a very similar name to the one I picked out. <laughs> so what was the name? Well, the name I picked was Witnesses of Jehovah. That's, that's not true. Okay. That's, that's not true. That's not true. All right. Get over it. All right. It's not true. Uh, but listen, I had this thing picked out. It doesn't really matter anyway. But I just didn't like the name Pioneer because the word Pioneer Association has coonskin hats and covered wagons. And, and in fact, we used to do that as a church. Pioneer Baptist Church, we used to have something called Pioneer Days. And we would dress up old fashioned and wear, women would wear bonnets and hoop skirts and, and, and stuff. And visitors would come in and think, are we in the twilight zone? What has happened here? Those were good days. I'm glad they're over. 
But the word pioneer does not mean something that's stuck in the past. It means to move forward into territory that is either undiscovered or has been ignored. Amen. And that's what we have here in verse number 20. Some people, yes, pushed out because of the persecution, but they go into Antioch. Now, I want you to notice in verse number 19 that there were some who went into Antioch and they preached the word to none but to the Jews only. But there were some who went into Antioch and said it's not just for the Jews. It's for anybody who has a pulse. Amen. They cross cultural barriers. If you'll study through the book of Acts, you'll realize that even as Paul's part of Paul's uh, MO, he would go into a city, he would preach in a synagogue often first, and then he would preach to the Gentiles. But these guys go in and there's some who just say, we're just going to go to the people we think we can reach, the people we're comfortable with, the people who know our culture, the people who, you know, it's a little bit easier to talk to them. But there are some guys here, nameless guys here, who say, you know what, it's not enough just to be here. We've got to go to the people of Antioch. We've got to go to the ones who are here from every tribe, tongue, and nation. What they were saying is God has brought people to us. We must go to them. And they go to the dark places of Antioch and preach the gospel. Why? Because the gospel dispels darkness. Why do they go to the dark places? Because the gospel dispels darkness. Can I ask you a question? You don't have to say it out loud. Answer it. Do you believe in the power of the gospel? Not in the power of your presentation. Not in the power of your alliteration. Not in the power of your personality. Not in the power of your winsomeness. But do you believe in the power of the gospel? The power of the gospel to change people's lives. The power of the gospel to save a man's soul. The power of the gospel to regenerate somebody. To bring somebody from death unto life. From judgment unto righteousness. Do you believe in the power of the gospel? And you and I would say, yes, we do. Then why don't we take it to the dark places of our culture? Why are we afraid? And why do we stay away? And why do we pick and choose who we think and hear and who we think will respond? I love these facts that these guys said, you know what? It's not right for us just to go to the people we're comfortable with. we got to go to everybody and take them the gospel. Amen. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter number 4 this morning. I just want you to see this morning real quick, just understanding the, the power of the gospel to dispel the darkness. Remember, they go to Antioch. They know what it is. They know what the people are. They know what the people are doing. At least in the Jewish synagogues, they had their you know, similar culture. They had at least grown up churchy. Somebody help me out here now. The, the, at least the Jews going to the Jewish synagogues. No, wait a minute. They don't believe the gospel, but at least they're, you know, they know how to act. They're not going to bring any drama into our life. They don't have sin cooties. You know, we got the same this, the same that, and we'll go to them. But no, there are some people who say we'll cross cultural lines. We'll cross comfortable lines. We'll cross anything we have to cross to bring somebody the gospel. Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, verse 1, as we receive, we receive mercy, we faint not, have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. If our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves. Do you see what Paul is saying? That Satan has blinded those who do not believe. You know what's wrong with lost people? Not just being lost, but spiritually blind. And it takes an act of God to open their eyes. It takes an act of God to open their eyes. But look what Paul says here. We, we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus, the Lord, and ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake, for God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness. Talking about, hey, God created and spoke the world in existence and brought light into darkness. He's speaking of God's amazing power, God's omnipotence, God's omniscience, who God is, the person, the character of God. He says, God commanded light shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of power may be of God and not of us. And we could chew on this for weeks and months. But hear what Paul is saying. God spoke the light into darkness. That's when 
when he brought the as he created the world, God is also through the gospel bringing light to men's darkened souls. This morning, I want you to have absolute confidence, not in your ability to win somebody to Jesus, because you can't do that, but in your ability to let God do what God's going to do, and in your ability to step back, be quiet, but speak the gospel, but not get yourself interjected, and just preach Christ and what God, what He can do through that. Amen. The power is in the gospel. The power is in Jesus Christ. Amen. I praise God for that. Because in here, I'm, I, I can pontificate and alliterate, but I am a, I'm Elmer Fudd when I talk to some, try to talk to somebody about their soul. I am. I, I, I mean, I, I, I don't, I, I quote verses wrong. I don't know how to present. I don't know how to talk and different things, et cetera, et cetera. But guess what? None of it is in the presentation. It is in the power of the gospel. Right. You know why? We think we have to win souls, which is why we don't. Wow. I can't do that. You're right. You can't. You were never designed to. You, were ne you never had to. The preaching of the gospel, the preaching of Christ produces faith. And God calls men to himself through the gospel. And so we got to go to the dark places. Not because we think we've got enough spiritual minds under our belt that we can kind of handle this person who's really far off. Hello? But because the gospel is powerful enough to smite the heart of a child and even the hardest of sinners. Amen. Let's go to dark places. Let's go, let's, let's, let's go to the people that we know, not, not just the ones that are what we think are soft, but let's just go wherever somebody is breathing and preach to them the gospel. Let's go to dark places. So how, how, does, how does a church rise up well, the truth of the matter is the church doesn't rise up. The church exalts Jesus Christ. And God uses that and magnifies himself, glorifies himself. Somebody say amen. That's okay. And brings people to himself through the preaching of the gospel. Christians are supposed to be running to the darkness of this world, not away from it. I'm going to say that again. We are to be running to the darkness of this world to face it, not running away from it. Christ followers are not escape artists. We're not looking for greener pastures all the time and easier ways. We're looking for where the gospel needs to go. The Lord really just drove this point home to me two very distinctive ways. One several years ago and the other just this week. How that my heart tends to run from the dark places, from the difficult spots to preach the gospel, from the difficult people to, to speak to Christ about. One illustration, I've used it many times in our church, is years ago one of my children said, I want to be a firefighter. You've heard me tell this a couple of times. He said, I want to be a firefighter when I grow up. I thought, that's great. That's awesome. Great. And I want to be a firefighter in San Francisco. Oh, no, oh, not there. Not that I used to drive in that city. I was a limo driver in that city. I, 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 I've seen the underbelly of, of that city. It's, it's it, yeah, I, it's Antioch minus the prettiness. I mean, it, to me, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. If you're from San Francisco and you left your heart there, let's go get it and bring it back to Sacramento, all right? I, I'm sorry, just, just don't go there. And I said, why in the world would you want to be a firefighter in San Francisco? And this was his response. Because that's where all the trouble is. I thought, that ought to be the Christian's attitude. Where do you want to go? Where all the trouble is. Where all the lost people are. I'm not looking for my comfort. I'm looking to preach the gospel to those who need to hear it. Our prayer guide for last Wednesday night was Psalm 32. And one of the prayer prompts was, Lord, I confess that I'm frustrated with evil that seems to go unpunished. Remind me that. And quite frankly, that's just be me writing that. And I said, remind me. And, and when I prayed that from Psalm 32, I remind me that you're the judge. That nothing you see goes, nothing that happens goes unseen. That you're going to bring every account into judgment. And the fire of God is going to come down. And I was taking great comfort in that. And one of our teenagers prayed, Lord, remind me. That people do evil things because they need to be saved. Amen. 
That's running to the darkness. I was praying for the fire to come down, taking comfort in that. Jesus had to tell his disciples once before, that's not why I came. And one of our teenagers said, Lord, remind me that the reason people are doing what they're doing is because they need to be saved. I wonder how many of us can't wait for the judgment of God, but we have forgotten that we are here to preach the righteousness of Christ through faith in his name. Somebody help me out here now. Let's be pioneers and go to dark places. Number three this morning, look with me, verse number 20. Some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they came to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. Some of them. We don't even know who they are. We maybe have an inkling, but we're not 100% sure who they are. We know the early church, there were some men from this region, and maybe it could have been one of them, but the Bible doesn't say. And so here's the, simply the third point as we see God turn this little cesspool of wickedness springs forth and bursts the church there. Can we just die to self and be okay with being an obscure agent for the kingdom? Let's just die to self. We don't know anything about these guys. We don't read anywhere where they came back and said, hey, Paul's getting all the glory, but when he were here first, what, where's my credit? Come on, help me out here now. They were just happy that God used them to bring the gospel to Antioch. Our culture is obsessing with notoriety and fame. TikTok. It's all about how many views you can get and also give your passwords to China. That's the truth. All right, but anyway, that's just for free. You'll study that. All right. It's true. All right, I think it is. I'm on a lot of right-wing crazy sites, so I don't know. But anyway, we've got people who are famous for being famous. And people just want to be famous for being famous. Hello? Yes or no? Are you living in America or am I the only one who lives around here? That's the world we live in. People want notoriety. They want fame. They just want to be known. And I want you to know it's a very worldly virtue. It's also a very satanic virtue. But we have here some men who are simply okay with the fact that heaven is watching their lives, that God is keeping record of what they're doing, the reward will be handed out in the world to come, and they're just thrilled to be a part, of just a little cog in the wheel of moving the gospel forward in people's lives. You know, God bless us all, and, and I, obviously I train for ministry, but every young preacher foolishly prays for larger influence. God, may I speak to thousands. God, help me to speak to thousands and millions and et cetera, et cetera. And the truth of the matter is we should not be praying for greater influence, just greater impact. God has to kill those dreams out real quick. He really does. He has to stamp on them. And I'm thankful that he's sort of stamped on mine. I still need some more stamping, and y'all can say amen to that. It's fine. But I want you to know that we think of Christian leaders, we think of every great movement of God, we think of, uh, of great pastors, quote unquote preachers, and we think of the Charles Spurgeons and the, and the this guy and the that guy, and we think, oh man, God really used that guy. But behind every one of them is a praying person, a praying Sunday school teacher, a praying mama. We don't even know their names. They were just somebody who was happy to move the gospel ball along so that God's glory and his kingdom could be furthered. Amen. As I was preparing for this message this week, I... I kind of just wrote down this little confession. I used to want to be something for Jesus. Now I just want to do something for Jesus. That's it. I, I, truthfully, I used to want to be, be something for Jesus. Be, 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 do big things. Now I just want to do something for Jesus. I don't care how big or how small, as long as Jesus gets the glory out of it and the gospel is furthered. Let's die to self. I want to tell you, and, and again, come back tonight as we consider 1 Timothy and looking at the gospel and its impact in our everyday lives. But I, I want to tell you tonight, today, this church can never become about you or me. Say amen. Don't bother me. Go ahead. You can give your loudest amen for that. Go ahead. That's fine. It really won't bother me. Because the moment you make it about you or I make it about me, we are going to lose our strength. We're going to lose our focus. We're going to become divided. We're going to become this. We're going to be very inward. It's going to be about our legacy. It's going to be about what we've done. All the, and we've forgotten that we're just here to preach Christ. That's it. Because it is not the name of Kyle Stephen Conley or fill in the blank with your name that will bring joy to the city. It is not my name or your name or even our church's name. Somebody say amen. 
that will change people's eternity. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ and Christ alone. And let's just be happy to be a little obscure, no name, insignificant agent in the kingdom of God. Dear sir, if all you ever do, according to the world standards, if you're married, you love your wife, you got kids, you raise your kids, you serve God to the best of your abilities, and you just do that faithfully until the day you die. If that's all you've ever done, you've lived a good life. The world may not take note of it. You'll not make it on the Yahoo or ESPN or any other. You might make it on Fox News. That's fine. Good too. You might not make it anywhere. You not, might be in the, the Sacramento Bee and nobody's going to, you're never going to trend on the internet. But my friend, if you just live for the kingdom, it's worth living for. Number four. Let's be obedient and just be confident in what the Lord will do for us. Look at me, verse number 21. And, and the Bible ends here that a great multitude, a great number believed and it turned unto the Lord. But it does not say because of these men's ability, men's ability to present the gospel or their learning or their knowledge or their efforts. I'm sure they worked hard. It doesn't say any of those things. It says it was the hand of the Lord that was with them. The hand of the Lord. I get church growth materials all the time. I will testify to this. None of them start with this heading point number one, the hand of the Lord. Starts with organization. Starts with marketing. Starts with strategy. Starts with these kinds of things and these kinds of things and these kinds of things. And I want you to know those things probably have their place and they do have their place. But they cannot take the place of the hand of the Lord. We have to remember this is the Lord's work. This is the Lord's doing. Without Him, it's just to show. But with Him, it can be anything God wants it to be. Amen. The hand of the Lord was with them. That's a powerful statement. You can trace it through Scripture. Nehemiah says, I want to show you how the good hand of the Lord has been with me. Ezra says, the hand of the Lord was with us. And look what he did. It simply means this, that while we're doing our things, God's doing His thing. Amen. God thinks. I say that with utmost respect. Do you understand that our best of our abilities are nothing compared to God, what God can do? That when God begins to specially and wonderfully work on behalf of his people, the hand of the Lord comes upon us, his blessing comes upon us, and there is no replacement for that. Amen. If the hand of the Lord is moving, what can the principalities do? What can the devil do? What can man do? I'm reminded in Acts chapter 5, the persecution of Peter and the disciples as they stand before the Sanhedrin and they're getting, they've been told not to preach in the name of Christ and they're trying to figure out what to do with them. Brother, can we help somebody with, can we get one of us out there and help with the kids, please? Bless their hearts, they're rolling over here. Thank you. Don't worry, they got out of junior church early, not you. All right, all right here you go. Please listen here. In Acts chapter 5, they're trying to figure out what to do with the Peter and the, the apostles. And Gamaliel says, I say unto you, refrain from these men and let them alone. For if this counsel be the work of men, it will come to naught. But if it be of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest haply you be found even to fight against God. Yeah. Folks, do you understand if the hand of the Lord is upon our church, that anybody or any principality or any wickedness that tries to stand up against us is actually fighting against God, not us? Yeah. And if God be for us, who can be against us? Can we not be confident? Listen, I come back to this again. Somebody said to me recently, boy, you've been preaching a lot on the sovereignty of God lately. I didn't know that was, you could preach too much about that. I'm sorry. Uh, but listen, can, can we not have confidence in the character of God? Can we not have greater confidence in God's willingness to work and God's ability to work and God's desire to work? Can we not say if God be for us, who can be against us? Can we not just be obedient, be confident, knowing that we're not trying to get God interested in what we're doing? We should be interested in what God is doing. He's in charge. But let his hand be upon us and let God work and be confident in that. I'm standing here this morning and I'm trying to tell you you're sitting in a place where God says, let me put my hand on Pioneer Baptist Church and give them something. Amen. And God put his hand on your family. He put his hand on your life. But remember, not to make a better you and for your best life now. Amen. God puts his hand on you to further his kingdom Amen. and his glory. I'm confident in what the Lord will do as we preach the gospel. By the way, unless I didn't make this clear, this whole 
message predicates on us being a gospel-centered, gospel-minded church. You you realize that all of this follows them preaching the gospel. I'll give you these last two or three. We'll We'll do them very quickly. These are just some things we see in Antioch Church as the Spirit of God is certainly working in their life. Number five or six, let's bless each other and live in the ministry of encouragement. What is, what is a church encouraging itself and edifying itself, as the Bible tells us to do multiple times, have to do with world evangelism and reaching our culture and our city with the gospel? Everything, quite frankly. Look at me, verse number 22. Then the tidings of these things came into the ears of the church, which was in Jerusalem. And they sent forth Barnabas, that he had go far as, as Antioch. Who, when he came, had seen the grace of God, which was glad, and exhorted them all with the purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. He is a good man. Full of the Holy Ghost and the faith, and much people were added to the Lord. Barnabas, a wonderful servant, we can study him out. We'll see him over the next coming weeks and months here. They send him to Antioch because they know that he's going to go into Antioch and he's not going to be the first guy to criticize something. Well, I know you guys are new and you know the Lord and everything, but did you realize you didn't park the way you're supposed to? Well, I know you claim Jesus to be Lord and Savior, but you still got this messed up in your life. No, he's happy to see the grace of God where they are, right where they are. Somebody help me out here now. He comes in and he encourages them. He teaches them and says to cleave unto the Lord. He's telling them, these new believers, it's worth it to live for God. Just cleave, stay close to God, stay close to God. And he encourages these people and he exhorts them. And he tells them to cleave unto God. And and the Bible says that because of his ministry, much people were added unto the Lord. Why? Because... The people of God, not in a fake way, not with fake, you know, you know, flatteries, but with real exhortation and encouragement. The Bible says they begin to build up each other and exhort one another. Gladness fills their heart. Joy fills their heart. And they realize that they've got something good in their life and they can't help but spread it to everybody else. Now, you can either spread manure blessings. You take your pick. Hello. Spread blessings. Be an encourager. Encourage one another. Do you know just by being in church this morning, whether you feel it or not, you have encouraged people? You do realize you're at least in a room where you're not the only one who thinks the way you do, that Jesus is worth worshiping and singing to and singing praises to? This this is Hebrews 10 telling us to exhort one another and, and provoke one another into love of good works and to assemble together to do these kinds of things. And as these people assemble together, they realize they were filled with the joy of the Lord. Wait a minute, we got something good. Let's go tell other people about it. You will never find a church that is truly gospel centered and Christ centered that is also filled with criticism Meanness, nastiness. It takes no skill to be a critic. Anybody can be that. But to be an exhorter. By the way, exhortation doesn't always mean you only say nice things. You have to reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering. Sometimes that involves tough conversations. Somebody give me an amen right there. But know this much. We can either come in here and bite and devour one another. Or we can pray for one another and bless one another. And encourage one another. And build each other up. In Christ. I love 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I'll just turn there. I want to read this little passage to you. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. And let me just read this to you. And I'll read verses just 8 through 11. But let us who are the day be sober. Putting on the breastplate of faith and love. For a helmet. The hope of salvation. God hath not appointed us to wrath. But to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. And this is Paul exhorting the Thessalonian believers to live in light of the return of of Jesus Christ. And verse number 11 says, Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. Now, let me just say this. I like the word comfort, but it's not what the word you think. Comfort one another. Bless your heart. It's tough out there. Just hang on. Jesus gets back. The word comfort literally means to embolden. It's what happens when a coach says, get in there and get it. Sorry. <laughs> Pacemaker's going off. Hearing aid's going off. Amen. See, you went to sleep. All right, you got comforted. I'm just here to discomfort the comforted. Amen. But listen, 
This is literally what the verse means. It means to encourage and say, wait a minute, Jesus is coming again. Go out there and live for Jesus. He's coming, he's coming, he's coming. Look into that. We're not going to go through the wrath that God's going to pour out on this earth. Somebody help me out right there. We're going to escape that wrath. Persecution, all fine, but wrath, no. And God judges, you'll be out of here for the judgment that God has upon this earth. So exhort one another and comfort one another and say, go on and live for Jesus Christ. It also reminds us that this world isn't worth living for because it's going to be judged. Function how you have to. Do what you have to. But live for Jesus. Point six and seven. I'll just read them. Seven is where I wanted to spend a lot of time. Let's unleash our gifts and bring others into the work. In verses 25 through 26. Verses 25 through 26. Barnabas says, you know what? There's something we need to do. Let's go get Paul. Saul. They go, let's get Saul. And the Bible says he literally had to search around. He finds him. After some years, Saul's just been, you know, he's been saved. He's been called. But he's just kind of, he's growing in the Lord. And Barnabas brings him in. And he says, let's help these people grow in the Lord. Now, why does he get Saul? Because God had told him Saul was going to be a special instrument to the Gentiles. And so Barnabas says, I know who are really good with Gentiles. The guy that's called to Gentiles. And let me just say this real fast. That's a lie for preachers. But, you know, real fast. Each of you, if you're saved, have a gift from God. Each of you. You may have one, but you got one. And we got it in different measure. We may have the same gift, but it's going to exert itself in different ways and exhibit itself in different ways. But know this, you have been given a gift of God to minister to other believers. If you study out spiritual gifts for the way that they're given, they're given to build up the church. You have gifts. What we even see here in the book of Acts, by the end of this chapter, we see some people functioning within their gifts. And I know this much. For Pioneer Baptist Church to be what it's supposed to be, every one of us are going to have to live in our gift and get involved in the work. Can I just say this? This is not your turf or my turf. I'm afraid somebody's going to outshine me. I thought we were magnifying Jesus Christ. You know why a lot of people's gifts are set on the side? Because somebody's afraid that it's going to outshine theirs. But if we're making this about Jesus and Christ alone and the gospel, then we really don't care who's doing what as long as Jesus is magnified. Amen. And lastly, Let's be defined by mission and earn a new identity. In verse number 26, the Bible says they were called Christians first in Antioch. Study this out. Up until this point, they've been called disciples, saints, believers, brothers, witnesses, followers of the way. But this is the first time in human history that the word Christian has been used. We just use it flippantly. By the way, it means too much today. Somebody say amen. Just because somebody says they're Christian don't mean they're a Christian. Amen. I'm a Christian. We're not living like the devil. Amen. Think biblically. Now, I'm a Christian. They were called Christians. Something very interesting. You study this out. In those days, a soldier, if he served underneath a, a commanding officer that he really loved, and he did his bidding, he would add I-A-N to his commanding officer or general's name, and that's what he would be called. So if you were living under Caesar, they would say, that's a Caesarean. Brutus, that's a Brutician. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but literally, it means Christ ones. They embraced, they spoke Jesus, they lived Jesus, they preached Jesus, they interacted with each other, fulfilling the commands of Jesus so much that the people out there said, that's Christ ones. They belong to Christ. It wasn't a name they came up with. It was a name they were accused of. Would anybody accuse you? It's not mine. I wish I'd come up with it. It's kind of a cliche now. But if you were being tried as a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict? Can people look at my life and say my lips match my legs? I do what I say. I say what I do. I got a lot of notes. I just simply want to tell you, what would happen if everyone has viewed every area of our life as simply a means and not a goal? 
Everything I have is just a goal to preach Christ and be a Christian, a Christ one. Let me give you an illustration from church history. There was a believer named Sanctus from Lyons, France, who was tortured for Jesus Christ, and they tortured him cruelly. They hoped him to get him to say something evil or blasphemous about Jesus. They would ask him his name, and he'd reply, I'm a Christian. What nation do you belong to? He said, I am a Christian. What city do you live in? I am a Christian. What is your family name? I am a Christian. His questioners began to get angry. They said, are you a slave or a free man? He says, I am a Christian. No matter what they asked about him, he only answered, I am a Christian. And they tortured him, tried to break him. He dies with the words, I am a Christian on his lips. And his torturers literally said, if there ever was a Christian, that is he. Because all they knew about him was that he loved Jesus Christ. My, my, your life, my, I, I'm not trying to deflate your confidence here this morning, but I am. Uh, I don't want people to know about, more about me than they do Jesus Christ. We need God to help us with that. Final three statements. Church doesn't have a missions program. The church is the missions program. We have a mandate from Jesus, and that's to reach our generation in our lifetime. And I hope you're in. Let God do what God can do. Only God can do what God can do. Let's be thrilled with that. Rest in that. You know, there's a freedom and a joy resting in God's work. When you realize it's all God, not of you, there's a freedom. You just go out with reckless abandon and live for Christ. It's a beautiful thing. Would you stand with me this morning? Let's close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come this morning as your people, sheep of your pasture. Thank you for the opportunity to gather together today. Lord, we're thankful for this building, thankful for the privilege, the freedom, all of these things to gather here. What a blessing. But may we be reminded what Paul says, if our gospel be hid, it be hid to they that are lost. Lord, may, may we be reminded that there are people out there who do not know what we know, but they need to. They don't even know about us. They don't need to magnify us. We can't save anybody, but Lord Jesus, you can. Well, let's rest this week as, as we're obedient in presenting the gospel, as living out the gospel, that your hand will be there. May we have greater confidence in your work and your desire to save people than ours. May we thank you for it. Lord, would you just keep your hand and put your hand upon Pioneer Baptist Church? We do not deserve this. We cannot manufacture this. But we do desire for you to work here and only do what you can do. Help us to be the missions program. Not simply have one, but be one. And if anything, may we simply be happy to be obscure little agents for the kingdom of God. Go out and do our business, but do it redemptively. To work, to play, to go to school, to live, to interact. Lord, whatever we are, to do such a manner that people would see our life and say, that's Christ-like. That's a Christ one. Oh Lord, help us all be guilty of being able to be accused of that. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I have three questions this morning. One, you'd say, preacher, I am a Christian. I know that I'm saved. I'm born again. I'm a child of God. I know that I know that I've been saved by God's wonderful grace. That's my testimony today. Quickly put your hand up and down this morning. Thank you. Amen. You're here this morning and you say, that's my testimony then. Let me ask you in a very real way, would you be willing to be a little Antiochian, so to speak, just for God to help you further the kingdom and God to use your life? I'm sure that's your desire this morning and I'll pray for you. Another question I'd like to ask this morning is in this room, under the sound of my voice, is there anyone that does not know Christ as Lord and Savior? Remember, being a Christian is not about going to church. It's not about religion at all. It is, have you placed your faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? Do you have a relationship with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords? Say, so, preacher, I'm a churchgoer, but I do not know if I am a Christian. Or I know I'm lost. I know I'm not saved. I don't even know what the gospel is. No one's ever presented to me clearly. 
Let me tell you this right now, if you're considering this, it's because God's working on your heart. God's tugging on your heart. God's opening your eyes. God is working in you so that you can come to know him. You say, preacher, that's me this morning. Would you raise your hand at all? Anybody at all in the auditorium this morning? Anybody at all this morning? Well, I don't see hands, but God sees hearts and that's the most important thing. Father, for sake of time this morning, we're going to close, but I would ask again that what you do in Antioch, you do here. Oh, how our city needs this. Oh, how our state needs this. Our region needs this. They don't need us. They need you. Would you use us to bring you to others and bring others to you? We'll thank you for it. What a privilege to be a child of God at such a time as this. Help us to run through the darkness, not away from it. Give us the courage and the strength to cross over some uncomfortable things in our life so that the gospel can be presented. We'll thank you for it. And all God's people said, amen and amen. Again, I want to encourage.